This video covers Disco Illusion's lore and what the newly translated book by Robert Kovitz reveals about it. The first shorter part of the video is about the novel and its context. I will not spoil the book's main storyline in either part, but there are spoilers about the world's development and side characters. Disco Elysium is by now a legendary game, coming from the hands of a once small post-Soviet art collective from a country most people couldn't point at on a map, it soon gained laurels on a global scale. And with its fame came the fans desire for more, anything more. Disco Elysium after all means learning about Elysium, about the rich world that the game is set in. The game was always supposed to be just the first small introduction into what is yet to come. Except it wasn't really the first part. Soon fans discovered the only other existing work of art that is set in the universe of Elysium, Sacred and Terrible Air, a novel written in 2013 by the leading genius behind the game, Robert Kurvitz. The fans hoped that the book will answer Disco Elysium's burning questions, like what is the Pale? What will happen to Ravishal? What really happened to Harry that made him lose his memories? And do the funny voices in the head of this amnesic, brain-damaged alcoholic actually tell us the truth about this world? All things that I will talk about in this video. There was, however, one big problem. The book is written in Estonian, Kovitz's native language. Estonian is a famously difficult language to learn and to translate. It's an Uralic language, nouns decline into 14 cases, and words look like this. Only a little over 1 million people speak the language of this small Baltic nation, making it difficult to find willing translators, preferably ones that are familiar with the game's concepts and vocabulary. And those who asked AIs for translations were met with an unreadable mess of a book that can be a little cryptic in the first place. There was an official translation planned too and it's probably already finished, but my best guess is that the current owners of Zaum are withholding it to not further associate Elysium with its actual founders. Thus a shroud of mystery surrounded the novel and it became somewhat of an inaccessible artifact of hidden knowledge. That was until, in the matter of only the last few weeks, several translations appeared online. The first one translated a Russian translation into English with an AI, since that was still more accurate than a translation directly from Estonian. The second one hired a professional translator. Most recently, a third group worked with a combination of native speakers and an AI machine translation. I personally like the last translation by group ebooks the most. While I cannot vouch for how true it really is to the original, the sentences do make more sense, the vocabulary is more consistent, and it has an overall better flow. I promise to not be too explicit on the book's main plot. However, in case you want to know about it, I link the summary under the video. Here I will only shortly talk about the novel and will then follow up with the main section about the lore of Elysium and what parts of it we can now better understand. After all, much of what we learn about the world in the game is through the funny guys in Harry's broken brain. I would not call that trustworthy. However, I was surprised by how many fan theories prove to be canon after all. Like Disco Elysium, Sacred and Terrible Air is a story about an investigation. It starts with the news about four young girls disappearing and then splits into two main timelines. The first is the year 52, one year after the events of Disco Elysium. It follows our three protagonists in their early teenage years and how they met the girls and ultimately fell in love with them. In the second timeline, 20 years later, our boys, now malformed men, meet again. All of them still unable to process the unsolved disappearance of the girls, all of them subjected to a way of coping. Therese turned into an unhinged cop with a fondness for MKUltra style torture, Jasper became a filthy rich asshole with a libido only sensible to the charms of teenage girls, and the last one, Khan, is an overweight neat in his mom's basement and an avid collector of disappearance memorabilia, things that happen to get erased from history and leave little more than grey plasm on everything they are recorded on, while vanishing from the memories that people have of it. He wonders what the pale has to do with all of that. Incited by a new lead and their need for closure, our three friends decide to investigate once again to find out what happened to the girls. The book can be challenging to read and this extends beyond translation problems. It often resembles a montage more than a storyline. You will inevitably assume the role of an investigator yourself to make sense of things, puzzling together clues and scenes, moving around in the book from time to time to revisit a place or a dialogue from a previous chapter. 
I don't think it's a coincidence that Covid's next project was a video game. It is in many cases the medium that is already anticipated in his style of writing, plot progression and world building. World building is something that Covid spends a lot of time on. This can be exhausting in a linear medium like a book, because it takes a lot of space and inevitably slows down the temporal progression. Obviously this is not bad style but an artistic choice and Kovitz is a master of these kinds of excursions. They do fit organically into the whole of the novel and the investigation, especially in retrospective. But maybe I am spoiled by the non-linear, interactive nature of Disco Elysium that lets you have the freedom to pursue the case when you want and to spend an hour listening to Joyce's remarks about the pale when you don't. I am aware that it's an unfair treatment of the book, any book really. But as someone coming from Disco Elysium, how can I not compare the two experiences? In the novel, whenever I thought, thank god the investigation is finally progressing, the paragraph ends and we're back at a beach scene from 20 years ago or in a vivid description of an overgrown railway. These kinds of parentheses feel like our old buddy shivers or encyclopedia popping up in our read-through, providing us with more or less relevant knowledge about our world. In a video game, many parts of this ornamenting writing style and environmental storytelling are absorbed into the game's environment itself. You see the overgrown railway when you cross it on the way to your suspect. The ornaments are already there, everything that surrounds the plot is already in the world. And you are free to stop and observe or to just let it sink in passively. Again, this is not a judgement of the book or a discussion over what the better medium is. After all, I'm an avid reader of complicated books myself. It's just that I'm amazed after witnessing how elegantly the style of Kovitz's book was translated into the mechanics of Disco Elysium. It's, for example, hardly surprising that he went for the skill system, always commenting in opening parentheses. It's the perfect translation of his writing style into gameplay mechanics. And there's one more analogy. The novel does not have a clear ending. I already talked about how the montage style of the book puts the reader into the role of an investigator, actively revisiting paragraphs and connecting chapters to the main story that at first glance appeared as just some nice to know lore insertions. It puts you in a role that is more interactive than that of a simple reader whose thought process is little more than the linear progression of the book itself. It's a role that the reader can only fully assume when they maneuver Harry through the streets of Revachol. I am La Revachelière. I am the city. I am a fragment of the world's spirit. In 22 years the first shot will be fired. Not a shot from a gun. An atomic device that will level all of me. And, indeed, 22 years after the events of Disco Elysium, a fleet of mask war destroyers crosses the Pale to the Insulindian Isola and fires a nuclear bomb on Revachol. We do not know about the fate of the game's cast, but if they stayed in Revachol, they are dead. We do, however, know that in the game, Esprit du Corps and Shivers let you listen to the head of the police station's plan to recruit Harry for a revolution in Revachol only months after the game's events. So maybe they get attacked because it worked out, like it happened once before, or because it didn't work out and they became too unstable to defend themselves. But there is more at play. The book hints that Mask wants to release the dormant anthroponetic catastrophe, meaning the Pale Hole in Revachol, in an ongoing campaign to sink the world into the Pale. Much of this has to do with a new innocent from Mask, the nihilist Ambrosius San Miro. I quote, just like the first innocents, Perikinesis once brought the concept of God to the humans, I infect them with the concept of nihilism. I am innocent and now you are too. I attack Ravishal, then Grad and then further. It never ends. I am evacuating the world. We will go to live in the past. All that remains of this world is a memory, an anthroponetic catastrophe. This is where nihilism leads. It is no longer what should be or what should not be. It simply is. The entire world is a zone of imminent anthroponetic catastrophe. Mask under the direction of San Miro does indeed not stop at Revachol. At the end of the book they attack Grad too and the world is at war. And not just with Miro, whose last words about the anthroponetic catastrophe prove to be true too. The world witnesses a sudden onslaught of pale that takes massive stretches of land in all of Elysium. 
and with it massive migration streams travel through the world. The prevalent feeling is that the end of the world is at hand. You can't find Miro in Disco Elysium, but I want to highlight another innocent whose legacy we encounter in the game and the book. One that will be of importance, especially as an opposition to Miro's nihilism. It's the one that Miro mentioned himself, Pericarnassus. He was the very first innocent and the one to give humanity anthroponetics, the study of the pale and how to cross it. Something that in Disco Elysium is done with anodic frequency transmitters, forcing dimensions into the pale and allowing for relatively safe passage. The ravers all adore him, they are fascinated by his teachings as an alternative to the cult of Dolores Day, her so-called humanism and her very pro-status quo philosophy of slow historical progress in the name of stability. This religion of history is false core, it is collapsed. We know from Encyclopedia that the Pernicanassians theorized about love being the key to immortality, or at least humanity's survival. For the Ravers, the core of Pericanassianism is the very concept of love and unity. This is what being hardcore boils down to for them. Anodic music and dance are the sacraments of their religion. It is not a coincidence that their club is set up in a church. The Pericanassian church is about love! Anodic music is about love! I got love for my Pericanassian posse! Love is the relay out of death! We die! The relay out of death, this is where it gets interesting. The book features a character named Ulf, the self-chiller. Ulf's deal is that he is a medium. Through anodic music he seems to harmonize with the pale and is able to extract information from it about that which is dead and bygone. And when the pale inevitably encroaches on his part house, part discotheque, it seems to freeze first and only when he stops the music the pale takes his home too. Knowing this, we can assume that the fan theory about the nightclub saving the city from the 2mm black hole might be right. The followers of Dolores Day previously built the church to achieve this. Encasement, confinement of something they were afraid of. But it is only when the church becomes an anodic music club that it fulfills its function. When Harry encourages the ravers to create an actual nightclub and not just a drug lab, he has given Ravishel a few more years. Ulf the self-chiller is a para-detective, not unlike Harry. For Harry though, the parts of his detective's kit that seem paranormal work a little differently. The pale too came with you. No one remembers it before you. The Nidarians do not. The radially symmetrics do not. There is an almost unanimous agreement between the birds and the plants that you are going to destroy us all. It is a nervous shadow cast into the world by you, eating away at reality. A great, unnatural territory. Its advent coincides with the arrival of the human mind. We suspect it will be something like the oxygen holocaust, only much worse. Instead of air, you exhale thoughts. There are no trees that eat thoughts. We have already seen that Harry's hunch as a cop of the apocalypse turns out to be canonical. He is not just delusional, not just projecting his own suicidal ideation. The world is indeed ending. The Pale is in the process of taking all of Elysium, as confirmed in the book, but we never know why. When we ask the Phasmid what the Pale is, it says something interesting, that it's a byproduct of human consciousness. We know through Zaum issued artwork that the Pale seems to be brought into being by so-called magpies, humans that are sensitive to a cryptic stream of future that flows into our present. When true novelty is extracted from the stream and then manifested as, for example, art, technology or ideology, it is something that does not belong in the current world, breaking the laws of causation and linearity. The Pale is the manifestation of a future that was preemptively realized and thus void and dead upon its arrival in our reality. This is why Noid and the Crabman call the church a sarcophagus, built around something dead, because the Pale is dead nothingness being spilled into our timeline. Harry too might be among those that are receptive to these dreams of future. After all, Shivers, Corpus Esprit, Half-Light and Inland Empire 
do tell us of things that happen in the future, many of which we can now confirm to be true, thanks to the book. And do you remember Ulf the self-chiller from before, the paranormal investigator? The book says he reads the sweeping pale like a magnetic reader, just like Trant says about Harry that As a police detective, he's like a magnetic reader on the world team. There are other references to this magpie mechanism in the game that you only notice when you know of it, like when Gary speculates how the Seolites use technology from the future to gain the technological edge over their competitors. The future? The Seolites are helping themselves from the future, and every little incremental improvement they receive in the present has major ripples all along the timeline. That creates a loop, right? The more advanced tech they send here, the more advanced they become in the future. This kind of development by a true novelty is not sanctioned by the moral intern and its philosophy of slow progress that I think is at least partly created to stop the spread of pale. You must understand, the moral intern is responsible for ensuring the continuance and flourishing of mankind for the next 3000 years. They do this by mapping out the actually possible future from the standpoint of the present in data sheets called contingency spreads. Responsibility for developing contingency spreads is only assigned to highly trained analysts working with advanced radio computers and a steady supply of drones. They use them to police the novelty-related deviations that occur against their prognosis. Revolutionary Ravishal fell outside of these planned for contingencies and was a deviation. Did she just admit that the coalition invading Ravishal was one of those contingencies? I could be wrong here though, and these analysts could be magpies themselves, employed by the moral intern to gain an edge of its own, and they would put Harry to work too if he gets extracted by them in the moralist questline. As another anecdote, when we discover the discarded tape by Arno van Eyck, our thought cabinet offers us a reason why he might have thrown it away. But why did he think it was retrograde? It wasn't. Perhaps he caught a glimpse of the future and did not want for it to arrive just yet. Perhaps the city whispered the top line to him and he was frightened by it. A music from before its time, from a future that should not arrive just yet. Maybe we found it just at the right time. It's a recurring theme in this video that a lot of the kitschy, edgy or straight up unhinged comments by Harry's skills and thoughts, the ones you usually dismiss with a chuckle, are meant far more literally than we thought. Take our favorite edgelord Half-Light for example. Tremble. The time is now. Taola. Time for the show. For Taola. The hallowed time of fear and disintegration. A countdown has begun. All will collapse on itself. The world will disappear into a single grain of blackness. All sound will be muted. All life will scream. Ulogu Theodos. Xino Zausin. Ipoli Osidien. Echondes Fronisin. You spoke the words of the Palindropos and the houses of Pericarnassus. Items, people, even words will tumble. All will lose its meaning in the coming years. The world island crumbles at your feet and in the far plain, Palindropos. The end of the world is by now canon, but there is a lot more to unpack. I already featured Pericarnassus, who Half-Light mentions, the first innocence, pioneer of anthroponetics and maybe even the one that the pale first spread from. After all, innocences are probably just some kinds of super magpies themselves. Palinthropos refers to the mechanism around the pale and novelty. It translates into turning back, changing directions, turning into the opposite. It is used by Heraclitus, whom Half-Light cites before, to make a point about how opposites coincide and are mediated through their counterpart to form a harmonious totality, the Taola from before meaning the whole. An abundance of one force, so says Heraclitus, will produce its opposite, redressing the balance of the world that is achieved not despite but through contradictions to create the Palinthropos harmonie, to quote Heraclitus. 
The pale is the counterbalancing force of Elysium, a void compensating for the things that are not supposed to be there yet, a negative value to counterbalance the surplus that humanity is appropriated from its future. It is, after all, against the laws of reality, or thermophysics if you will, to just produce something out of nothing. That is why it is accompanied by said nothing, the pale. In the book there are two anthroponauts, or pale travelers. One is Ziggy, an apocalyptic nihilist and a stern believer in San Miro. He travels with the plasm of the communist Ignaz Nielsen, the leading theorist of inframaterialism, a school of communist thought that Stiban and Echomaker study and that teaches us how Under certain exceptional circumstances, the proletariat's embrace of historical materialism may be so fervent that their beliefs take form in the world of matter. A lot of the dialogue between Ziggy and Ignaz is about communist optimism and nihilism. When, in the depths of the pale, Ignaz goes on to argue against Ziggy's cynicism and wants to instill belief into his traveling companion, the pale around him recedes just for a moment. Stiban and Echomaker speculated about something like this. Those same theorists have hypothesized that revolution may in fact create a counterforce that prevents the pale from expanding. And just like the cult around anodic music traces back some of its core elements to the church of Perikinassus, it might be similar for Elysium's inframaterialism. The theorists Puncher and Watman, not inframaterialists, but theorists nonetheless, say that communism is a secular version of Perikinassian theology, that it replaces faith in the divine with faith in humanity's future. I have to say, I've never entirely understood what they mean. I'm convinced that this is a reference to Marx's critique of Hegelianism, proclaiming that it must lose its mystifying idealism to reveal its rational kernel. By repeating Marx's figure of thought, inframaterialism puts Perikinassus from his head on his feet to conceive of the real material forces of history, the potential of humanity, and maybe the material equivalent of Perikinassian love. Both inframaterialism and the hardcore mode of being operate in some reference to Perikinassian thought. Fittingly, throughout the book, only Ulf, the self-chiller, and the plasma of Ignaz Nielsen were proven to have repelled the pale for just a few moments. Ultimately, this leaves us with only two things that might be able to delay the onslaught of pale, communism and being absolutely hardcore. I promise to talk about Harry's memories and why they disappeared. Perhaps. Just a thought. This has something to do with the hangover. Well, maybe, but even if it is a drug-induced amnesia, there was a reason for Harry, who is otherwise a relatively well-functioning alcoholic, to get that drunk and suicidal at that exact time and place. Throughout the game, we realize that Harry knows too much. He fears the coming end and even learns about the nuke. And most interestingly, Sona also mentions how he knows far too many details about the 2mm pale anomaly in the church. Far more than a cop should know, let alone an amnesic one who doesn't even remember his own name. Harry's own theory is that the memory loss has something to do with the pale hole, but he can't prove it. Here again the book helps us out. Memory loss is a main motive of the book too. You might remember the protagonist who collects disappearance memorabilia traces of things that vanished from records and collective memory. His theory is that when things cross through the pale and accidentally enter a pale anomaly called a superdeep, their whole existence, including the memory of it, is deleted from the world. The old pale driver tells us about this exact superdeep too. Usually the effect of the pale is to invoke memories in a person, their own memories and those of the world. But they say there is a point one that I have not crossed, in the pale super deep, where every step you take is one step further from home, no matter the direction. It's a point you cannot come back from. Your mind becomes so radiant with the past, there is a flip. Instead of writing, it erases memory, nearing some kind of indescribable finale. Maybe you've been down the motorway south. Maybe Harry went down there too where the pale starts deleting memories, to the anomaly in the church, a condensed pale superdeep. And just like the radio frequencies cease in the pale superdeep, the anomaly in the church too shrouds you in absolute silence when you stand under it. 
Maybe Harry received his impossible knowledge of the past and future from the Pale, where a convoluted time invades the human mind and had his own memories deleted by the Pale Hole in the process. But even though we cannot prove that it was really the anomaly that erased his memories, we can at least assume that being in contact with the Pale Hole brought up his past, like the usual Pale does, and led him into a suicidal spiral of drug abuse. Nostalgia. Cooped up in the cabin, shaking. Terrible nostalgia. For yourself. For humans. It's too much to bear. Maybe he let the pale fill his head with old memories of his painful past until it became unbearable. We know that Harry fainted from simply finding an old letter in his ledger without even having any real memory left of what it was about. The real deal, the real contact with his past invoked by the pale would have caused way more emotional and ultimately neurological damage than a piece of paper and a faint memory. Yet it wasn't just the past that made our protagonist flee into delirium. The future seemed no less terrifying. We know through idiot doom spiral stories that, in the process of dragging himself into oblivion, Harry was already coping with his knowledge about the end of the world. We don't know if it's his ability as a magpie or his contact with the anomaly that gave him his premonition. Just that... You revved the engine and screamed at the top of your lungs. The time hath come for tequila sunset. The end of all things. Let's finish up by talking about this end of all things. For me it is one of the most impactful takeaways of the book that I will carry into future playthroughs of Disco Elysium. It fully recontextualizes Disco Elysium when we know that it was a deliberate artistic choice by the game's creators to place the game in a pre-apocalyptic world and beyond that in the city that will be the first one to go probably in the lifetime of Harry, who, together with his companions, will probably die. Why did they make that artistic choice? To answer that, let's have a look at an adjacent yet opposite genre. We have all grown accustomed to apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic games, shows and movies. In our 21st century, they have become more or less ideologically hegemonic mass products of our pop culture industry. Because ironically, even though they are apocalyptic, they still serve as escape fantasies. They are about delegating responsibility and guilt, reducing social complexity, about thoroughly enjoying a highly stylized badass hellscape and about coping with the alienation that is already forced upon us by our pre-apocalyptic world. Having an asteroid, a zombie megavirus or some madman with nukes destroy humanity is always more comfortable, cathartic even, than facing the truth that it will not be one ahistorical, abstract big flash, but the self-imposed horror of slowly rotting away through decades of boring mediocrity and slowly decreasing living standards. And when you think of it, no one has yet written a dystopic hellscape that is not still somehow appealing and aestheticized, with characters that have not only adapted to the misery and alienation, but seem to thrive in it. But when Harry tries to embrace it all and be an edgy apocalypse cop, it's actually just really sad because of how obviously he is coping. Even our edgelord Half-Light admits it. It's totally also a coping mechanism. Being devoted to the end of the world is just as much an escape mechanism as naive optimism and ignorance. When Harry succumbs to his delusions, they are not delusions of a happy world, but, and I think this underlines my point, of a dying one. My favorite Walter Benjamin quote says that Humanity's self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own annihilation as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. This is the grim enjoyment of the drunk, self-destroying apocalypse cop indulging in aestheticized death drive. It is the cathartic pleasure of apocalypse that his innocence Ambrosius San Miro and his disciple Ziggy give into. Even communist Ignus Nielsen proclaims that if the world is not able to love itself and his idea, the second best outcome is total annihilation, when the world is finally encapsulated in the darkness of the sacred and terrible pale. Disco Elysium, however, starts the exact other way around. Harry, after a sloppy suicide attempt, floats in a comfortable darkness. 
The first thing you do as a player is telling him not to give in, to go back into a world where there's nothing but pain for him. Disco Elysium does not want to offer escapism, not even into catastrophe. That is because, as Robert Kovitz said himself, Disco Elysium is not a paracosm, meaning a fantasy world to flee into, but the opposite. It aims to be more real and horrible than our real world. It exaggerates all that is interesting and terrible about history. And it's far more terrible and demanding to stay sober, figuratively and literally, in a present that is blindly hurling itself towards a very grim direction, than to either ignore or to submissively accept and anticipate its worst future. That is why Elysium is neither post-apocalyptic nor non-apocalyptic. Disco Elysium is allergic against this kind of repression that keeps you from facing reality full force. That is why even the harbinger of the apocalypse, Tequila Sunset, still breaks down crying at the end of every second conversation and is always one dialogue choice and a skill check away from killing himself. And it is also why the world of Elysium is slowly being rendered uninhabitable by the Pale, a byproduct of human civilization that we exhale in the name of progress, causing mass displacement and migration into the few livable areas left. All while Elysium's nations are in the process of spreading the pale even further, if it only means gaining an economic edge over their competitors. It does ring a bell, and because it rings a bell, they made Disco Elysium play there. The magical part of Elysium's magical realism is there to make it more real than our real world. You walk around in the streets of Revachol, and suddenly you realize that you know that kind of person or ideology. But you see it by means of their disguise, not despite of it. Caricaturists know that a little distortion is better suited to depict reality realistically than a realistic drawing ever could. Elysium's method is a similar extrapolation. All that is interesting and terrible about history and only that, magnified, rarefied, spreading outward from reality like a dark grey solar corona the crowning ceremony of the world. Disco Elysium and Sacred and Terrible Air both start with a small-scale investigation that escalates into global dimensions. Maybe it's because I spend too much time with both that my video wants to do the same. You might not believe me, but I already cut a lot out of the original script. After all, there is still much to clarify, especially if you read the book, Weapons of Absolute Negation, 12-tone music, Nihilmat and Where Have the Girls Disappeared To, and who knows what I pick up in my second reading and next playthrough. Because knowing the book and the game, there are now a lot of small moments in them whose significance I never would have noticed without knowing both. So maybe when you have read the book yourself, you come back here and see a video titled Elysium Lore Revisited. But in the meantime, I already have other disco-related stuff and work that I'm really passionate about. And I hope you subscribe to the channel to be here when it rolls out.